3 on what our justification consists. And I read the, the, the article two weeks ago, and, and I'm not going to read the whole article tonight. But we started looking at the idea of justification and what it consists of in light of um, Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, the, uh, the parable of the wedding feast. And so I'll read that again this evening. Matthew 22, starting at verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it. And they went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways, and they gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Thus ends our reading. Let's ask God's uh, blessing on his word. Father, again, having read your holy, infallible, and inspired word. A word uh, that comes straight from you. But even in particular, this one comes straight from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, uh, uh, a word that has so much power and beauty, but also a word of warning. Lord, we pray that your spirit would be here, that you'd open up our hearts and minds, that you would guide us in, into understanding. Lord, we pray that you be with my mouth and guide my mouth and bring forth the, a good word and that you give to everyone here exactly the portion it is that they need and for those who do not yet know you, Father, as, as Savior, who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and have not submitted, we pray, Father, that they would come and that they would fall upon him and be broken and be saved. All these things, Father, we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. What makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world? And some of you have heard me say this before. It's, and it's a fact. It's a reality. Every religion in the world, with the exception of Christianity, has this one thing in common. Every religion in the world, I don't care where you go, and I don't know, and I don't even care how immoral or how nasty that religion is. There is some kind of morality at the center of it. And it's about what you do. Every religion in the world, with the exception of Christianity, is focused on what you do. It's about your deeds. It's about your words. It's about your actions. That's how you'll reach heaven. That's how you'll achieve nirvana, whatever. It's all about what you do. Christianity is the lone exception. Because in Christianity, the focus is not on what you do, but what Christ has done. Christ is our all in all, and he is the one that our eyes are focused upon. And that makes Christianity distinctly different. And brothers and sisters, that's what justification is all about. That's why it is the key doctrine of the Christian church. The key doctrine, the word means teaching. The key teaching, justification by faith alone. So what does our, our justification consist of? This evening I'm just going to read a couple of words out of, um, out of the uh, Belgic, uh, Belgic Confession, Article 23. It says that we ascribe all glory to God, humbling ourselves before Him, relying and resting upon the obedience of Christ Crucified, crucified alone. 
which becomes ours when we believe in him. This is sufficient to cover all our iniquities and to give us confidence in our approach to, in approaching to God. And then a, a sentence or two later, it says Adam, and, and it speaks of the idea of this is the only way that we can be clothed. And, and it speaks against Adam, who trembling attempted to cover himself with fig leaves. Now, I believe that all of the Word of God teaches the doctrine of justification by faith alone. It can be found from the beginning to the end. But this, this parable in Matthew 22 is a very, very powerful demonstration of, of what justification is about. And, and I actually think that once we get it, it actually is just such a clear, beautiful picture. And so last time we started and we, and we saw something that many of us have not seen, that in the Greek, it's not in the, it's not in the English, but in the Greek it's as clear as day that Jesus says, he begins by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man, a king, who arranged a marriage for his son. Another way to say it would be that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is like a human king who arranged a marriage for his son. And I believe that what is happening there is as clear as day that Jesus is speaking about the king. The king is him. And you'll note that throughout this, this whole parable, you don't really, we don't read of a, we, we don't read of the son. We don't read of, of the bride. The king is the one that we, our focus is on. It's all about the king. And the king is the one that drives the action. So the last time we just looked at the first part of it, and we are talking about the people who had been invited. And the word invited in, the, in, in our English here, in the Greek, is all the same word. It's always the same word. It's the word called. The ones who had been called, right, did not desire to come. They, they, had, um, they, made, light of his, uh, they made light of his invitation. Um, they rejected it. They rejected his, his, his servants. They killed them, etc. Okay, so who are those people? Those people are, and Jesus is speaking about the Jewish people. He's speaking about the leaders of, of uh, the Jewish nation. He's speaking about all those who have been invited to come follow me. Jesus has made it clear enough through his preaching, his teaching, and all that he's done that he is the Messiah of God. And he's actually in the temple, and this is his last public teaching. And he is telling, and he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and they know he's talking about them. That's actually what it says. Right? It says, now when the chief priests and, and Pharisees, verse 45 the, of chapter 21, and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. And that's exactly who we're focused on in that first part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the parable. And, and so we talked about that last week. And so we're not going to go over all, or two weeks ago, so we're not going to go over that. If, you, if you're interested, um, you can look it up on uh, CERN Audio or, or even YouTube. But... Uh, we're going to kind of work to the middle real quick. And, and so what happens? They, they kill his servants. And then it says in verse 7, the end of it is, when the king heard about it, he was furious. He sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. And I, and I find this very powerful because this is a parable. Yet in this parable, Jesus is actually prophesying. He's prophesying about something that happened. It happened exactly, almost literally to the day. From the, from the time of his Passover to the time of the full fulfillment when the, when the, when the Roman armies broke through into Jerusalem and finally, because they were, they were all around the city for months, but from what I understand, on A.D. 70, on Passover, they finally broke through the walls and they destroyed that city and they destroyed all those people within that city and they destroyed that temple. Jesus is speaking of that in a parable. This is what he did to those who had been called but rejected him. Okay, but that brings us to, to, to the centerpiece, the, kind of the center of, the, of the, uh, the parable. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. Now, now note that. I want you to note something there for a moment. Part of the Jewish mind was that if we do not accept Jesus as the Christ, then he's not. That was their mindset. And the reason I bring this up for a moment is because 
This is often what we hear people say. Well, I don't like that. I don't care. I don't like it. I'm not accepting it. I don't believe that. Right? And you and I think that we make reality. Well, if I don't believe something, then it's not true. Well, that was exactly their mindset. If Jesus, if we do not accept Jesus as our Messiah, because we're expecting a Messiah on a white war horse that's going to take us to the top. We're going to destroy all our enemies before us. He's going to bring us to a kind of prosperity we've never seen before. That's the one that we're looking for. This man does not look like what we're looking for. And so their mind and their heart is that if we reject this king, then he's not the king. But verse 8, Jesus tells us that the king says that the wedding feast is ready. This wedding is going down. It is going to happen. It is happening. And it doesn't matter how many re people reject and how many t people turn away. This wedding is going to happen. But the second thing that he says that we want to note for tonight, because this is our focus tonight, but those who were invited were not worthy. Those who had been called, the Jewish people, all the way from the time of Abraham on, they've been called to, 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 to believe and to, to look for the Messiah. They were not worthy. So that's tonight the focus of what we're looking at in the second part of this parable is that begs the question, right? They were not worthy. So the wedding's ready, and now we have to have guests to fill the wedding, but they have to be worthy. The ones who had been called are not worthy, so what is and how does this king define worthiness? And I told you that in the first half, when, the, when, when Jesus is telling this parable, that for the listeners, when the king sends out an invitation to come to the wedding, and it says they did not desire to go, that was a stunning development for the people that were listening because nobody listening is thinking to themselves you're going to get a king's invitation and turn it down that is stunning nobody would do that there's an equally if not greater stunning development in the second half right because look at what happens we got a the wedding is ready those who were invited were not worthy okay so we're going to find worthy people therefore go into the highways and as many as you find invite to the wedding all right, now the highway is actually a road, it is a name for the crossroad. And we don't, our cities are so big and there's so many highways that we don't really picture this. But in the ancient world, most, most cities and towns were walled. They were walled and they had a certain amount of gates. If, a, if you had a small city, you might only have one gate. If you had a bigger city, you might have two, three, four gates. And then you could close those gates at night and you could guard those gates so the people inside the town would be safe. But outside those gates, not too far away, would be this highway, this crossroad. And what it means is that, so, so say we're talking about a town that has a, uh, that has a gate to the south. Okay, so go outside that gate, and as you follow the path, the road out of there, you're going to come to this crossroad. And there's going to be a road coming in straight from the south. And then there's going to be a, coming in a road from the east, and there's going to come in a road from the west. Go to that place where those roads meet. And listen to what the king says. Invite as many as you find, invite to the wedding. Okay, so like we're looking for worthy people to come to the wedding. But he says as many as you find. Well, you know what you're going to find at the crossroad? everybody you're going to find rich the noble born poor slaves criminals right you're going to find men you're going to find women you're going to find strangers from every 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 uh nation and country around there traveling and crossing paths and you're going to find everyone of every kind and type well, maybe that's not what he means. Maybe, maybe the king's not being quiet. He's, maybe he's leaving it up to his servants to figure out as many as you shall, as you shall meet, right? Um, as many as you find, invite. But look at 
verse 10. Verse 10, Jesus tells us what the king's servants, how they translated or interpreted those words. They went out into those highways, into those crossroads, and they gathered together all whom they found. Okay, all. That means uh, all, all right? It means everybody. It doesn't mean uh, all these good people. No, all, and then just to make sure we understand, both bad and good. And the word for bad is the word evil, right? It's both evil and good. All right, so no mistake here. The king is inviting you, everyone, doesn't matter if you're, if you're highborn or lowborn, it doesn't matter if you're a slave, doesn't matter if you've been a criminal, it doesn't even matter if you are a criminal, right? It doesn't matter if you have good manners or bad manners. It doesn't matter if you're a thug, a drug dealer, a killer, it doesn't matter. Invite all to the wedding. Both good or both evil and good. And what does that even mean, both evil and good? You know, because how does, God, how does Jesus define good? We, we know because even in Matthew, he has the story of the rich young ruler. You know, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, good master, um, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God and, and, or the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, why do you call me? He starts the conversation. Why do you call me good? Do you not know that there is but one that is good? That is God. So the standard of good in Jesus' eyes is God. Is that what he means here? I don't think so. I think that what, what he's doing is what they call uh, in, in uh, literature a marismus. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's setting the boundaries. Take the most evil thing that you can think of, Hitler or Stalin or Mao or somebody over here, and then think of the best, most decent human being you've ever met or ever known. Okay? That's the limits and everybody in between. Now, if you're listening to this, right, especially when Jesus is telling us, this king has been rejected by the ones who have been called, his own people, the Jewish people, but now he's going to, he's got this wedding and it's ready, and so now he's looking for worthy people and He's calling everybody. Well, what if you're rich and you don't really need God and you kind of look down on religion, etc.? You know what? You're invited. What if you're a really immoral person and you've thought about religion and you've thought about God and you've thought about the things you should do and you're like, eh, I just don't want to do those things. I want to do what I want to do. You're invited. You're invited. That's insane. Isn't it? That the call goes to everyone. You are invited to this king's wedding feast. You are invited. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you haven't done. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how evil you are. You're invited. There is no discriminating factor that you have done. So, they went and gathered them all. And then it says the wedding was filled with guests. And the word filled means fulfilled. It means that the, that the wedding reached its full capacity. The people that, that he had wanted to be there, and so if the, and I'm just going to throw a number out, okay? I'll just say 5,000 people. He's got a capacity of 5,000 people. There's 5,000 people. It is filled. The wedding feast is filled. But of all, how are these people worthy? How can they be worthy? What is the standard of worthiness? You invite everybody, both evil and good, no matter how, you know, because some people are morally better than others, etc. And there's some people that are pretty upstanding people that have done good things and never gone to jail and never made people angry. They're over here and, 
And you've got people over here that have killed, committed every sort of evil thing under the planet, every abominable thing, and they're at this wedding too. So what is the standard of worthy? How, how does this king, what makes someone worthy to be at the wedding feast? And brothers and sisters, this is what he tells us next. When the king, verse 11, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. A wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So this wedding garment is the defining factor. I'm just cut to the chase, right? The wedding garment is the defining factor. Right? We'll say that in this whole parable, there's two defining factors. One, the invitation. The first people that are considered not worthy are the ones that didn't even bother to, to answer the invitation. They're the ones who despised the king. And they despised, they didn't want to go to his, to, to his wedding. They were the ones that heard the gospel call to come to Jesus to repent and to forgive and to follow me. And they said, I don't need it. They never even responded so that in, in, in itself tells us that they're not worthy, so that's one thing. But here's someone that actually seems to be at the wedding, but the king comes in, and this person stands out like a sore thumb. Why? Because they don't have on a wedding garment. But everybody else does. The only thing that distinguishes this person is the fact that they don't have on a wedding garment. You know, last, last time, two weeks ago, I gave, a, I gave an illustration because we were talking about the, the whole idea of how crazy it would be that if you got an invitation, and I used, you know, an example of, you know, just a fictional idea of, of you know, like an Amway corporation or something, and a DeVos family or something, just a fictional beans, okay? And, but let's just say they, that we had some people like that around here, and, and they were worth billions of dollars. And one day, you get an invitation in your mailbox inviting you, very nice looking invitation, inviting you to one of their grandchildren's weddings downtown. And it's everything. I mean, it's going to be beautiful. It's at the best place downtown, right? And it's, there's going to be bands there. There's going to be food. It is going to be wonderful. And I said, how many of you would not how many of you would despise that? How many of you would just not desire to go? How many of you would just say, take that lightly and say, ah, did you see this? What a joke. And I thought, and I, I hope I was kind of getting the vibe, right? I'm, I'm thinking most of us, I don't think, would despise that. Most of us, I think, would be somewhat honored. We'd be like, I don't know how I came up on their radar, but why would I be invited to this amazing wedding, right? Because I am just educated enough to know what kind of people hang out at these kind of places, right? Because billionaires have other billionaire friends, okay? And millionaire friends. And they got friends that are athletes, professional athletes. And they have friends that are, are musicians, uh, world famous musicians, etc. They've got all these friends and all these people that they know that all of them are special. How did I pop up on this? Because I know that I'm not special. I'm just a regular guy. So I said that I didn't think that most of us would despise that invitation, but many of us might wonder about what, whether or not we would go just because of the fact that we would not fit in. Because if you go to a place like that, I'll just tell you this, right? The, the people that go there, super highly educated. They've got all the proper manners, right? They wear suits. If you're a guy, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 suits. They wear beautiful shoes, handmade from Italy, a thousand, fifteen hundred bucks. And you know what? That's nothing compared to the women. Some of the women will have one-offs, 
right? Top designers will make one gown and they'll, they'll be wearing it. $30,000, $40,000, $50,000. The, some of the poorer millionaires, they're just going to have $10,000, $15,000 designer dresses. And shoes that are worth thousands of dollars, but that's nothing compared to the jewelry that they'll be wearing. How are we going to fit in there? And I said, I don't think, I think that if anything kept us out, it wouldn't be because we didn't want to go or that we were in some way looking down and rejecting that, that invitation, but it would rather be that maybe we wouldn't fit. And if you think about a king, a great king, and having this, this wedding feast, how do all these people, high-born, low-born, in the middle, right? People that have done, done horrible, abominable things, people that have li lived decent lives, how can they all come together in one place and everybody feels like they belong? And it's about the wedding garment. You see, they all have the same wedding garment. And if we all have the same wedding garment, you don't, you're not going to look down at me. I'm not going to have to look way up at you. Oh, whoa. You really shine. I really feel poor in your sight. No. We all have the same garment. Except this guy. This guy doesn't have the same garment. And notice what the king says. Right? Because the, the king is saying that th this man, he, he got in here and he's not wearing this garment. And all of a sudden, and, and the king says to him, friend, it's a very strange term. And it's used about, it's only used in Matthew. And it's a very strange term because I'm not going to go, we don't have time for me to go through the, the usage of it. But every usage that he does, I'll say the last usage. The last usage is, is what he says to Judas in Matthew 26. When Judas comes to him to kiss him and he's got his his police with him and he's come to betray Jesus and he kisses Jesus and Jesus says, friend, why have you come? And the idea is, is that I've not done anything wrong to you. I've not done anything evil to you. But what you're doing isn't right. And that's the sense of that word, friend. Friend, in a, in a way, it's like, what have I done to you? Why are you dishonoring me this way? But then he says this. How did you come in here? You see, this king has a door. And the guests that belong here, the guests that are worthy, the guests that have on a wedding garment, came in a certain way because that's how they got the garment. How did you come in here? Because what the king is saying, you didn't come in the regular way, did you? You came over the wall or you did something weird or strange because if you would have come through the door, if you would have come through the proper place to come in, you would have on the wedding garment, but you don't. That's what it says in John chapter 10, right? It's the good shepherd. He's the door. Jesus is the door. And that's what Jesus is saying about this king. Jesus is this king. This king says, you didn't come in the right way. You didn't come in through the door. Otherwise, you'd have on the wedding garment. And you don't have on the wedding garment. And when he's talking to him, what does the man reply? He has no reply, does he? He's speechless. Why, why do you think he's speechless? Because he's one of those, brothers and sisters, that's interested in Jesus and wants to come to Jesus, but he likes his own clothes. You see, because if you went down to that wedding that I was talking about in Grand Rapids, you'd meet a lot of people that really dig their clothes. You'd meet people that know I look good. Oh, they're going to have a wedding garment and everybody's going to look the same? Not interested. Not interested. I'm special. I know it. 
and I'm going to wear my own duds, okay? But when the king's talking to him, he's speechless. And I'll tell you why he's speechless. Because all of a sudden he notices the glory of the king's garment. And now he looks around and he sees the glory of all the other garments because they're all wearing the same garment as the king. And now in the light of those garments, he looks at his own garments. And he has nothing to say. He didn't come in the right way and he knows it. You see, brothers and sisters, what Jesus is doing is he's actually working off different scriptures. Isaiah 61, verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. You know what the wedding garment is? It is a robe of righteousness. And it's not your righteousness. It's not what you've done. Right? Because that's why he says, everybody's invited, both evil and good. It has nothing to do with your works, good or bad. It has nothing to do with your beauty in this world, good or bad. It has nothing to do with anything related to your, you know, what makes you special in this world. What makes you worthy at this wedding is that wedding garment. That robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. See, the opposite part, the same prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 64, he tells us what our garments look like. For all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf and and our iniquities like the wind take us away. I don't care how moral and how upright and how decent you are, even compared to good people around you. In the light of God's righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, filthy rags. That's why the man can't. He's speechless because he sees it now. Now he sees it. The king's in his face and now he's looking at it and he sees sees it and now he looks at his own clothes and now he gets it. In the, in, the, in, the, in the view, in, in, the, uh, in the glory of the king and his righteousness, all of a sudden he sees how shabby, how poor, how naked he is. I got one other text that I want to finish up on. Because I've always kind of wondered about this text. There's always been a question in my mind about this text. In Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I was always kind of in the back of my mind a little bit. Why is he rejecting them? I I didn't really get it. I, I... There was something about them, but I didn't know. I didn't understand fully until this afternoon because it came together with this garment. We did many. We did this in your name, and we did that in your name, and we did the other thing in your name. We. Jesus says, I never knew you because if they were really mine, they wouldn't be talking about what I did. I mean, myself. I did this in your name. I did they wouldn't be talking about me. They would be talking about Jesus. We'd be talking about what Jesus did. We'd be talking about his righteousness, his love and his mercy. In the, next, in the next Belgic Confession, we'll begin to look at, at the works of sanctification. There are works that Christians are called to do. But we are not justified in our works. We do not stand in the kingdom of God. We do not stand at the wedding feast in our works of any kind. I don't care. There's one wedding robe. There's one wedding garment. 
and it's the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, this is the amazing thing, and this is what the, the Belgian Confession, Article 23, picks up on. This is both why God gets all the glory, but it's also what gives us our comfort. It's what gives us our comfort. Somebody told me the other day, a minister was telling me that he met a man at a hospital, and he says, I really got to talk to you. And he was an older man, he was a Dutch Reformed man, and he says, I got to talk to you really bad. And so the minister sat down and talked with him for a while, and the, and the guy's like, I, I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned. He'd been going to church all his life, been a Christian all his life, probably held office in the churches, a deacon and elder. But now he's approaching death, and, and all of a sudden he's worried, and he's worried sick. And the first time he, he just tells him, I'm scared. The next time some more details come out about things that he's done, but never confessed. Things in his own family and, and things that, and the minister just told him. Two things. Number one, your comfort is not on what you've done. Good or evil. Repent in the name of Jesus. Believe in his righteousness. The next time the man came to tell him, he was in tears. He said, you know, I've reached out to some of these people that I've hurt. He says, and I can't believe it. I can't believe how good they've been to me. I can't believe how they've forgiven me. And He was a man that was walking all his life in his own righteousness to some kind of a, and somehow the, the Spirit of God in love and in mercy as he's approaching his death. This is one of his, but he's not wearing the right garment yet. And he came to that man. He worked in his heart and he worked in his mind. And he opened his heart and his mind so that he could confess his sin. I don't know if he's still alive or not. But I know this. That if he has stopped relying on his righteousness and he relies 100% on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, he has comfort. He has comfort, he has blessing, and it doesn't matter what happens in the world. It does not happen. Live or die, Christ is mine. And I am his. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, once again we come.